It's that time of year again, folks. The time for you to imbibe in your half and halves, partake in a bit too much Jameson, and vomit on your Aran Island sweater already. Happy St. Patrick's Day. No, it's not like the coffee stuff. It's got a different name, but it's a bit problematic. It's half Guinness, half Harp. You don't say the other one. But since it is my favorite holiday to get wicked soused, I decided that tonight I'm going to discuss an Academy Award winning director whose 2022 feature film was criminally underviewed. That's right, tonight we're going to talk about Martin McDonough, specifically his take on the themes of martyrdom, and how the nuance he brings to his films shows the good and bad of praising those who sacrifice their lives. <laughs> Before we move on, thanks for watching, be sure to like, share, and subscribe, do all that YouTube stuff, but I would also like to give a minor spoiler warning. Now, to be fair, I'm going to be spoiling the heck out of all of these films. However, most of them have pretty significant twists in them, so we all know what this channel is. It's not a review channel, it is a companion piece. So I would urge you to go watch the films and then come back and watch this video. As a preamble, I need to give a bit of a cultural lesson on Ireland. And no, I'm not one of those Irish Americans who say, because my great-grandfather came from Ireland, that means I'm Irish. I'm an American, and we as a people, Irish Americans, constantly decide to say that we're Irish too many times. It's malarkey. You're not from Kilkenny. You are from Dubuque. But when it comes to Irish culture, I feel like I can speak on it with some level of authority. Not much authority, but definitely more authority than you. And you want to know why? Exactly. So, a key thing to understand about Irish culture is Catholicism. Yes, that Nazarene carpenter sure did a number on an island half a world away once he got nailed to a tree. Catholicism has this weird fascination with those who sacrifice their lives for their faith. Maybe it's because of that aforementioned carpenter. Maybe because a lot of the early parts of the religion's history, they butt heads against the powers that were, and said powers did what most authority figures do when they're up against something that's butting against the status quo, and they tried to kill it with fire and lions. But needless to say, Catholics can't get enough of that persecution complex. We love it. And after an English bloke came over to Ireland and decided to compare the Holy Spirit with the three-leaf clover, they killed all of the snakes, pagans, and they began to worship the one true Roman god. They took to it so much that once the Roman world fell into the Dark Ages, much of culture was survived because Irish monks wrote it down. Along with Catholicism, Ireland's relationship to their neighboring island had a significant influence on their culture, if not more so. You see, Ireland was, and, stepping into a bit of hot water here, probably still can be argued to be England's oldest colony. Even before it was the British Empire, England had a stranglehold on Ireland. This goes all the way back to Henry the Wife Head Cutter Offer. And once England went way of reformation, what with the aforementioned Wife Head Cutter Offer, they had this shiny new religion that they wanted to impose on the Irish. However, that didn't take with most of the country, and a long story short, it wasn't a pleasant 700 years. The combination of being a colonized people, along with being so devoted to the Catholic religion, led to a storytelling culture that deified those who sacrificed their lives for causes that were greater than themselves. Folk songs like The Fields of Athenry or The Foggy Dew, historical figures like James Connolly and Patrick Pierce, and, of course, historical events like the famine or the countless rebellions that cropped up every now and then, all created this sense of national unity surrounded by figures who sacrificed their lives. Look, this idea is so deep-rooted that in Belfast, there is a mural to Bobby Sands, an IRA member who decided to starve himself to death to get political status for the prisoners of the IRA a terrorist group. 
So when looking at the films of Martin McDonough, a British filmmaker and playwright born to two Irish parents who has dual citizenship, it is clear that when he brings martyrdom into his films, it is a continuation of what came before. Even his Academy Award winning short film, Six Shooter, ends in a teenager going out in a blaze of glory. His plays and his films ooze with Irish culture, dark humor, and brutal violence. So let's talk about them in the context of martyrdom. <laughs> Don't drink Bushmills, drink Jameson. Historically, Jameson was the Irish whiskey of the Catholics, whereas Bushmills was the Irish whiskey of the Protestants. However, now that both of them are owned by international conglomerates that no longer have ties to Catholics or Protestants, um, drink whatever you want. I don't care. Yes, yes, responsibly. Drink responsibly. Come on. Oh, Bruges is not a shithole. Bruges is a shithole. Right, we've only just got off the fuck. In Bruges is a film that came out in 2008, and it stars Colin Farrell as Ray and Brendan Gleeson as Ken. Two hitmen who are hiding out in Bruges during the Christmas time after a job goes wrong. Look, I already did a video on In Bruges, so I don't want to get too in the weeds here, but... Let's discuss the characters. Ray is young and inexperienced as a hitman and is shown to have botched his first job. Ken feels responsible for him because Ken brought him into his line of work. And when their boss Harry comes to deal justice and have Ray killed due to his transgression, Ken puts Ray on a train and offers himself up to Harry. And Ken's really milking it here, being all Robert Powell. Like who? Like Robert fucking power, like of Jesus of fucking Nazareth. But when Harry gets word that Ray is still in Bruges, they struggle before Harry shoots Ken and he goes after Ray. And there, standing atop the clock tower in Bruges, with a magical fog covering the medieval city, Ken has only one way to get word to Ray before Harry arrives and kills him. So he throws down the last euro coins he has in his pocket, he straightens up his tie, and he jumps off the building. So now that we know what happens, let's dig into the themes that McDonough is bringing to this specific martyrdom. With Ken, his sacrifice is probably the most in line with the one that Jesus did, you know, sacrificing himself for the rest of the world or for others. You see, the film is about redemption and purgatory. Can one be redeemed after committing a heinous act? Or, in the film's specific case, can Ray be redeemed after he... And it's in the works of medieval art and the church that apparently has Jesus Christ's blood in it. And all the old buildings and that. Where Ray is being constantly ripped apart, spiritually and psychologically. To the point of his attempting suicide. And Ken has this paternal instinct to him. Yes, he's a killer, and he says he's killed many people. Maybe a hired killer is not the best moral center for anyone to have, but it's what we've got, and he's trying. He has accepted that he is not going to be able to leave his life of crime. All he can be is a thug with a gun. But in Ray, he sees somebody with the potential to do good with his life. Somebody with the potential to do anything with his life. So, like Jesus, after sending Ray away, Ken decides to take Ray's sins on himself and offer himself as a sacrifice in place of Ray. And he believes in giving Ray an opportunity for redemption so much that he jumps off a building to give him a warning. And it is both one of the greatest uses of Luke Kelly music used in cinema history, and it is the first in a long line of films where both Martin and his brother John Michael McDonough will decide to kill the greatest Irish actor of his generation in Brendan Gleeson. Seven Psychopaths was released in 2012, and it stars Colin Farrell as writer stand-in Marty, a screenwriter struggling to write his next screenplay titled Seven Psychopaths. And if you didn't guess already, this movie is meta as hell. Sam Rockwell plays his best friend Billy, an actor-slash-dog kidnapper. Christopher Walken plays Hans, Billy's partner in crime. And Woody Harrelson plays Charlie Costello, a dog-loving gangster. To cut a long and very funny movie short, Billy and Hans steal Bonnie, a shih tzu owned by Charlie Costello. And he doesn't like it one bit. 
So much so that he sends his goons after him and finds their hiding place where they keep the dogs. There, Marty struggles with the fact that his girlfriend left him and his own alcoholism. And he's about to tell them where the Shih Tzu is before a masked killer named the Jacko Diamonds comes and blows their brains out. Jacko Diamonds, he's a guy that only kills mid to high ranking members of the Italian American Organized Crime Syndicate or the Yakuza. Yakuza. So, with Charlie after them, the trio run off to Joshua Tree and kind of hang out for 30 minutes, where they do peyote, work on Marty's screenplay, and they generally talk about life and peace and meaning. But eventually they find out that Billy is actually the Jack with Diamonds killer, and he burned their car, and he called Charlie Costello to come get the dog because... This movie has my way. Hans, the Quaker pacifist that he is, walks into the desert after a bad trip and he makes his way to the visitor center where he sees Charlie's goons hanging out waiting for a signal. Probably, but in this film, the martyrdom is an expansion of pacifism. You see, Hans's backstory is explored in a story within a story, how this metafilm likes to do, where a Quaker takes it upon himself to haunt a man who killed his daughter, watching him from afar until the guilt ravages the man so much that he decides to kill himself. Because even if he ends up going to hell, that will be a peace of some sort because the Quaker won't follow him. Hans even carries a brutal scar across his neck that shows that he attempted to follow this killer into the afterlife. But throughout the film, Hans is very clear that he is against violence. He's willing to help Billy with his screenplay titled Seven Psychopaths. As long as it isn't going to be too violent. Even after he sees that his wife has been brutally murdered, he does not get violent. He uses passive aggression. So when he sees Charlie's goons at the visitor center and makes note that there are police officers there as well, he knows that while he can't overpower them and he wouldn't even shoot them if he had a gun on him, that he can make it so that Billy and Marty have an opportunity to survive. He reaches into his jacket, the goons shoot him down, and he reveals a tape recorder that he has been making notes for Marty and his screenplay, allowing for the cops to have the opportunity to come in and save the day once the climactic gunfight ends. Do they save the day? I'll let you watch the movie to find out. And it is with his sacrifice and his addition to the leitmotif of the Vietnamese character in the film shows the power of pacifism in martyrdom. Don't drink the green beer. It's just Bud Light with food coloring in it. It's gross. And now we get to 2017's Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Now this one might be the one most people saw in theaters, which to me feels a little disappointing because as much as I like the movie, it's probably his weakest film. If I have to say anything about its quality, I would say that McDonough just doesn't have the right touch when it comes to American culture that he does when it comes to Irish culture. The film is about Mildred, played by Frances McDormand, trying to get justice for the assault and murder of her daughter several months before. She buys three billboards and publicly antagonizes the police department for not having any progress shown in the investigation. Woody Harrelson plays Bill Willoughby, the chief of police of Ebbing, and Sam Rockwell plays Jason Dixon, a police officer who's pretty emblematic of the American justice system. And there are many more, but it's not really important. I mean, they're all important. Every actor is a special snowflake, but I'm sorry, John Hawks. I'm sorry, Peter Dinklage. I'm sorry, Clark Peters. It's just not about you. Now these billboards really caused a stir in the town. Chief Willoughby kills himself, not because of the billboards, because he has terminal cancer, but most of the town assumes it's because the billboards call him out by name. So Jason decides to throw the man who owns the billboards out of a two-story building, which gets him fired. Then the billboards get burnt up in an arson attack, which leads to Mildred deciding to burn down the police station. Unbeknownst to her, 
Jason is in the building. And here's where we get to the martyrdom. While it's not actually martyrdom because Jason doesn't die, he still puts his body in physical harm in order to further a cause. In this case, it is justice. See, he's in a local dive bar, drowning his sorrows of being burnt to a crisp and having no employment. Isn't that always the case? And he overhears a patron describing in great detail an assault and murder of a woman that fits on the same timeline as Mildred's daughter's murder. Knowing that the lack of physical evidence has been a key hurdle that the police have been attempting to overcome, he slyly gets the license plate number, scratches the man's face, and then he allows himself to get pummeled into a bloody pulp. Unfortunately, the hope that this sacrifice could lead to the arrest and conviction of the brutal assault of Mildred's daughter doesn't pan out, as it is clear that he was not in the country at the time of Mildred's daughter's attack. And when the final self-sacrifice for justice fails, this leads to Jason and Mildred going off on a road trip for retribution and vengeance, because while he wasn't an assaulter of Mildred's daughter, he clearly assaulted someone else, and they will not stand by it. This could be viewed as McDonough commenting on martyrdom itself, as the previous examples for redemption and for pacifism led to good outcomes. This example, for failed justice, just leads to violence. And as Samara Weaving's character says in the film, violence begets more violence. I didn't make it up myself, though. I read it on a bookmark. And finally, we come to the most Irish movie of all Irish movies that were released in the past my lifetime, 2022's The Banshees of Inish Erin. In the film, Colin Farrell plays Porrick, a simple man living on an island off the coast of Ireland, and his best friend, Colm, played by Brendan Gleeson, decides that he doesn't want to be friends with Porrick anymore. And that's the movie. Seriously, that's it. It is brilliant. It's a fantastic fable about violence and Irish history, fittingly being set on the outskirts of the Irish Civil War that happened during the 1920s. And it is a meditation on niceness, and how even the kindest among us can spiral into nastiness if enough things push him in that direction. There's a nice dog, Carrie Condon, Barry Keoghan, and a charming pub that serves the black stuff. But to dig into the martyrdom, let's discuss Colm's point of view. Colm is a musician. He's a fiddle player trying to create his magnum opus, a song entitled The Banshees of Inish Erin. I just like the double S-H sounds. But as he's gotten older and he has seen that he has not progressed in his artistic endeavors as much as he wishes he did by this point in his life, he decides that he has been wasting his precious time to create art, shooting the shit with Porig at the local pub. The push and pull between personal life and your artistic endeavors is something that most artists can understand. Most people can understand. Your personal and professional lives are not necessarily always on the same track. Because I'm spending my time walking and talking about movies to you. So Colm decides to stop being friends with Porig so he can pursue his artistic endeavors as the dullness of the conversations are so monotonous that it is apparently commonplace to hear Porig discuss for hours at length the things he finds in his little donkey's shite. It's me pony's shite, which shows how much you were listening. But Porig, not the brightest lantern in this small Irish town, he takes it personally and wants to figure out what he did wrong and make amends so he can just live the same charming, happy life that he has been. And his constant attempts to reach out to Colm leads to an ultimatum. Colm says that Porig is not to bother him in any way or else he will cut off one of his fingers. And he will continue to do so until he has no fingers left. So we're talking the picture of mental health right here. He is willing to sacrifice his body in the pursuit of music and art and immortality, which I guess could be argued as something bigger than himself individually, but it's more that it's petty and self-righteous rather than for a greater good. And as the fingers start coming off, as everyone knows that that was where this movie was heading, McDonough plants his flag. 
After Porig thinks that he made his peace with Colum and plans to meet him down at the bar, Colum cuts his remaining fingers off and does what he does every time, throwing them at the door of Porig's house. After Porig's sister left for the mainland, his buddy Dominic, played by Barry Keoghan, decides that he doesn't want to be friends with Porig anymore because Porig has turned out to be mean like everyone else. And now Colum, unequivocally making it known that he doesn't want anything to do with Porig, stamping out that final hope of reconciliation. The only constant remaining in his life is his beloved pony Jenny. He loves Jenny. I love Jenny. He even lets Jenny live in the house with him because... She just wants a bit of company, Siobhan. But when he returns from waiting for Colm at the pub, he follows a trail of fingers to the back of his house. And what he sees there is the dead body of Jenny the Pony. When he inspects the last bit of happiness that he has dead on the ground, he sees one of Colm's fingers lodged in her throat. So not only was Colm's martyrdom unproductive, because a fiddle player without fingers is as useful as an insert whatever metaphor you want for uselessness, and self-aggrandizing, it is also harmful as it caused the death of an innocent. Sometimes martyrdom can be useful, bringing people together with redemption and pacifism and even justice. But sometimes, as McDonough says in this film, those thinking that they are right in performative sacrifices, they're not only doing it for self-aggrandizement, which leads to the promise that violence and hate will continue to fester. Thank you for watching this essay on martyrdom in the movies of Martin McDonough. Makes you think. Makes you drink too. You know, like this holiday we're celebrating. So be sure to like, share, subscribe, all that. And, um, slancha. Don't urinate in public. It's all fun and games, but a criminal record is forever. Yes, but you also constantly lick where your nethers once were. Oh my god, you had to do a Lucky Charms dig. That was just... Because I have a genuine problem. Please help.